Welcome to the Recruitment Rollercoaster podcast. My name is Hisham Azuz, and today I'm really excited to be joined by Gareth Morris, who is the CEO of Evolution Recruitment Solutions, uh, who are an international tech recruitment business with offices in the UK, Germany, Singapore, Australia, have circa 160 people in the business, and have been going for um, 20 years. <laughs> Gareth, thank you for joining me. It's nice to be here. How, uh, how have you been over the last couple of weeks? What, what's been going on for you? Yeah, good. I mean, um, really proud of, of the response from, from everyone that works for the business. Um, everybody is, has been mobilized and, and can work from home due to a, a great effort from, from the IT team. And, you know, p- people are up for the fight. They're, they're, they're working hard and they're doing their best in, in difficult circumstances. Love that. So we are going to do our utmost to uncover and unpack the last 20 years. Um, obviously, you, you've been in the recruitment industry for a while, to, to say the least. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm excited to sort of uncover the journey that you um, have been on. But where I always like to start on this podcast is how, how did Gareth enter the, the world of recruitment? Let, let's start there. Okay, um, I uh, graduated from Sheffield Hallam University with a, a business studies degree um, and great dreams to, to start a business. And I, I realized that um, although I've got a theoretical knowledge of business from the degree, I actually haven't got any practical experience of anything, <laughs> uh, but bar working in a bar. <laughs> so um, all through uh, my, my degree, I uh, you know, used to chat to, to my best friend at university, a guy called Nick Elliott, about starting a business, uh, dreaming of what we're going to do and, and how we're going to start a business when, when we finished our, our degree. So it's the summer holidays after the degree. I'm, I'm living back at home and my mum says, you need to get a job. <laughs> uh, and for any, any, any graduate that's, uh, you know, just left university, that's a bit of a shock, isn't it? To be honest. Yeah. So um, I think from memory, Nick had, Nick had gone traveling. And um, so I looked in the back of the Manchester Evening News and I saw this advert and it said uh, entrepreneurial people wanted uh, highly motivated, uh, great OTE, fast moving industry, IT uh, recruitment, and I just thought, thought that advert sounds like me. So, 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 well, so I what gave, year was this, Gareth? Uh, whew, now you're asking. Uh, 97, 98, okay. that sort of time. Okay. Um, so I rung them up and, um, you know, pretty naive, didn't have a CV. And they said, well, c- come for an interview. So I went for an interview, met four people um, and liked the sound of, of recruitment and what it was all about. And, and they invited me back for a second interview uh, down in London. And they said, there's just one thing we need to, you to actually write a CV. So <laughs> that was the first CV that I wrote, uh, went down to uh, Computer Futures head office and, and, and got offered the job. And, and um, yeah, that, that was the start of my career in recruitment. And, and that just, just for everyone's benefit, how long did you work there for before you started Evolution? Two years. Two years. Okay. Yeah. Well, so Computer Futures is part of the S3 brand, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So obviously we're going to have a real focus on evolution, yeah. but j- just really quickly, always curious to sort of hear and ask around people's experience in working in, in, um, for S3, just because it's been the, the spawn of so many recruitment entrepreneurs and recruitment businesses, I guess. Yeah. What, 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 how would you round up your experience and how would you describe the environment you was in in those two years? Oh, it was uh, really good. R- great, great fun. You know, I, I just graduated from university and I was working with a lot of like-minded people. Um, I think that I, I worked in the Wilmslow office and there was a lot of people that were, you know, degree educated, uh, bright and uh, highly motivated. Um, and, and to be around that in that environment was just, just really, really good fun. Um, I think some of the... Um, you know, more, more negative stories you might hear about S3. I didn't see really any of that in, in my time there. And maybe that was something that was a culture in perhaps other offices, but, but certainly not up in, uh, up in Wilmslow. So yeah, g- good fun, work hard, play hard, give you a great grounding in, in recruitment. And, you know, you, you're having the time of your life. You, you're young, you're free, you're single, and you're, <laughs> you, you're working with other people who are similar to you so yeah. what, what, what's not to like living the dream in Wilmslow absolutely absolutely <laughs> um okay so clearly 
always obviously all, already had this sort of thought when so when you was at uni thinking about starting your own business yeah so i guess thinking back then what what do you think gave you the confidence to start your own recruitment business where did, how did that come about um i just always wanted to start my own business growing up so i can't really e- explain to you why um i used to be, be really into sport and you know i'd go past sport shops on the way home and think oh, i'd like to own one of those one day mm. um and then at university we had to do a, a placement year and uh, i applied for a number of jobs and i got a job um in marketing for a vesta steel in okay. Sheffield, and I just thought that sounds really dull. Marketing steel. <laughs> it's a, it sounds. If you think recruitment's tough, that that sounds really, really challenging. <laughs> um, so what I did is I went to the university and said, "Do you know what? There's only so many placements. Um, yeah. I've got this placement through through you guys, but I want to start my own business, and someone else can have my place at, at a Vesta Steel in in Sheffield." And they they, they kind of said, "Well, no one's ever done that before." I said, well, my best friend at the time was, was a locksmith and he uh, wanted to start his own business. He had locksmithing skills. I had two years of a business studies degree and, you know, truth be known, probably knew very little about anything. Um, but we started that business in, in, in that placement year. So um, I That's sold amazing. Yeah, I sold my half of the business back to him for the princely sum of five thousand pounds, and then went went back to to university uh, for my final year flush with uh, with an extra five grand in my pocket. How? Where? So, where did this entrepreneurial sort of mind like? What was your parents like? Was it, was you in an interest environment growing up? Or yeah, where? Good, 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 good question. No, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, I, I, I love my mum and dad dearly, and they were brilliant parents. Uh, very supportive. Never really tried to tell me what to do. They only gave me one piece of advice, and the one piece of advice they said is, "You can do anything you want in in life. Just don't be a teacher." So they <laughs> uh, they, they they were both teachers, and okay. probably felt that you know, um, although the holidays were good and everything else. Um, it maybe haven't hadn't given them the lifestyle that they would have hoped, but you know, obviously, when they were growing up, a stable, steady job with a decent pension was what people wanted. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, they 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 certainly weren't um, entrepreneurial. Uh, but what they did do is encourage me. So, if they want, if I wanted to do something, they they'd never say, "Oh no, you can't do that." They'd yeah, say, you were, okay. yeah, you wasn't worried about failing or giving things a go, which is half of it, right? Not because um, I think all. if you think back then like how was entrepreneurial the cool thing to do probably not it was the thing that you just said again a steady job pension so i think that's just really interesting that you had that sort of innate motivation yeah it never just never appealed to me i I think reading um you know richard branson's books possibly Mm. you know uh, maybe as a teenager thinking god that sounds exciting you know running uh, record labels and uh airlines and things like that 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 maybe whetted my appetite but i think it was just something i always wanted to do and always thought i could do really um yeah so that's always been in me so so you so obviously started in um started evolution recruitment in in 2000 yeah. right or yeah okay so just just paint the picture very quickly like what what was the landscape of the it recruitment market at that point well the, the, there'd been this new thing called the internet <laughs> <laughs> and uh you know, I remember someone in, in, in the Wilms office starting a patch called the internet. That's wow. what they did. That was their, that was, that was their market. And I remember kind of, um, going on a few client visits and, and these companies saying, yeah, we're, we're 20 people now, but in two years time, we're going to have a hundred people. And yeah. there was the, the dot com uh, boom. And there was a bubble where these businesses were worth a huge amount of money. Um, and being young and, and relatively naive, I didn't think, you know, the dot-com boom was going to become a dot-com bus. <laughs> so I thought this is a great chance to start a business. You know, we Evolution initially were specialized in internet, e-commerce and new media. That was our kind of strap line. Okay. And um, about probably 12 months in, uh, the dot-com boom was rapidly followed by the dot-com bust <laughs> and uh, we we diversified out into you know it recruitment rather than just specializing in so, e-commerce yeah. internet and, and, and new media and and just quickly just for everyone listening in context so obviously started that business with a couple of other people yeah in uh, so nick elliott my business partner and cfo 
um, and a friend of my t- at the time who was uh, working in recruitment. Yeah. Um, the three of us started the business, um, and it was in the cellar of my house. Uh, we had to we kind of got the the cellar tanked and fitted out, and uh, it was so damp down there that we actually had to kind of lock the paper away in a in a sealed <laughs> container. Um, and we did a year working literally underground um, with no no real light, uh, pretty damp. Um, but it was, uh, it was a great time. It was fun. And yeah. I think, you know, when we got the very first check through the post for our, our first placement, it was a kind of great source of celebration. And I think that, that, that first year was about, can we make this successful enough to move out and get our own office, get a proper mm. office with windows and everything and, uh, mm. and, and, and sunlight. So we, we managed to do that after about 12 months. Um, but, in 2001 obviously September the 11th happened and anyone was working in the industry at the time it, it, it you know it definitely hit demand um, I'm not sure whether it was officially a recession but there was an awful you know there's a lot of companies that stopped recruiting and um, the, the, uh, the the third business partner at that point uh, was getting married and decided that he wanted a steady job and an income yeah. and, and move out moved out of the recruitment industry um, and then, uh, yeah, Nick, Nick and I cracked on. So, so going into the sort of second year, and if we just sort of break it down, I guess, into sort of early years of evolution. So I had that experience in the year one where the dot-com bust um, got out the cellar, um, obviously ended up being you and Nick. I guess sort of obviously, obviously the fact that, I mean, you're in the real top percent of recruitment businesses in terms of size. Um, so I guess in those early days of evolution, like what obviously the mindset at that point was get out the cellar but did you and Nick have these sort of big vision conversations of what what this business could be or what what was the sort of mindset early on on what the intention was for the business was it a business you wanted to to grow or was it just year by year focus on that yeah we we, I think we've always tried to uh, think ahead and look ahead so probably when we were uh you know, a tiny business with two or three people. We try to think like a 10 person business. When we're a 10 person business, we try to think like a 30 person business. When we're a 30 person business, try to think like a 50 person business, etc. So yeah, we were always trying to plan ahead of what we'd need to put in place to make the business successful um, at, the ne- at the next stage. And I think we probably always invested the, the, the money and the profits of the business back in the business to try and grow a, gr- a great company. That was always, always the goal really to try and grow something significant and sizable. So I think, you know, on day one, did we start with the end in mind? We're going to be operating in four countries and have 160 people. No, we've, we've not. It has been an incremental journey, but I think it's always trying to look to the next stage and what you need to put in place now to make that happen. Mm. And I think that's, I think that's where a lot of people, that's the challenge that a lot of people have. I'm sure yeah. you now have plenty, have had plenty of conversations with other recruitment business owners, but yeah. from the conversations I have, it's, it's the, it's the opposite way around. It's, we'll do that when we get to 15 heads or we'll do that when we hit this certain milestone. But very early on, you was, you was doing what you, was required before you got to that point. So did yeah, we, that really enable you then? To, yeah. So that really enabled you to to scale or obviously grow the grow the business because that's how you're thinking about it. We just reinvested in the business. We weren't greedy ourselves, or you know, some people that you meet they have a little bit of success and suddenly they've got the flash car and everything yeah. else. It's it's you know, if you're going to grow something sustainable in the long term, you've got to reinvest your time, your effort, and your money back in back in that business and make it stronger. It's like if you're going to build a house, you have to build it on solid foundations. You know, you can't you can't skimp on your foundations, otherwise the whole house will fall down. So that mm. that's been the mentality that we've we've always had really so what what was one what was the sort of maybe early years then of evolution what was sort of one of the maybe couple the the sort of first real key milestone that obviously the first one getting out of the cellar obviously but the first couple of years obviously what what was the sort of first milestone where maybe you turned around to nick and was like right we're we're really onto something here or sort of where was the point where he was like right let's really push on or we've got to a great point here because obviously after year one you had to change slightly IT yeah. recruitment ended up being you and Nick, but what was the sort of first key milestone, I guess, early on uh, in evolution that really sort of motivated you guys or 
Um, it's a good question. I, th I think we were we, we were lucky in that we ended up hiring a number of people who had some recruitment experience that maybe we'd worked with previously or that had worked at companies that we knew of. And even though it was never part of a, a plan, we probably ended up with six or seven people who knew how to do the job. And, and what that allowed was the, the kind of owners and founders um, to take some time to work on the business rather than in mm. the business because there was other people that could generate fees. So, um, yeah, I think I remember doing our first hundred thousand pound month and thinking, wow, that's amazing. You know, that, mm. that, that is, we, we are starting to get somewhere here because if you, you know, you multiply that out, that's over a million pounds over a year and you think we've actually got a business. Um, so I think it was getting those, group of people that could actually do the job and that freed up time to work on the business rather than in the business what was the rough timeline of that because again i think that's one of the common challenges right and and why a huge percentage of recruitment businesses in the uk are sub 10 staff it's because gareth morris the recruitment business owner doesn't get those people in early or isn't having the mindset of making myself redundant so I can do more on the on the business so I guess what was the timeline of that was it over a three four five year period where you got that opportunity to have more of a sort of get your head above the water and think about on the business yeah and how it's, you're a, gonna it's, it's, it's a good question it, it, yeah I, I don't think it was immediate I, did, mm. I do think it did take a little bit of time um, I'd probably say two or three years some, some, something like that so mm -hmm. we probably ended up with uh, perhaps 10 people in the business and it meant that as I say we could work on the business rather than it, in the business mm. okay so let's just talk about that for a second because I'd love to sort of just try and sort of think about what your mindset was at that point so obviously a couple of years in under obviously under five years old got people in there billing giving yourself more time to focus on the business. So I guess we're sort of coming up to towards 2003 to 2005, right? Yeah. So I guess at that point, what, what was the mindset on how you're going to grow this business? Was it the typical, let's get five more recruiters in, hopefully that means we'll do 200K months and then keep growing it like that? Or obviously what, what were the sort of things that you were thinking about at that point to get you to the, the next part? I think, I think the one of the catalysts was it's very difficult to grow a, a meaningful size recruitment business by only hiring people that have experience because there's just not huge numbers of good quality people that are looking to join small businesses you know um people and where was you based sorry we, we were based at that stage in warrington so we okay. moved from in warrington as well <laughs> yeah ex exactly exactly so i think um i read a book called the e-myth and I'm reading that at the moment. Yeah, it's a re really, really good book. And it's saying that most people that start businesses aren't truly entrepreneurs. Uh, for example, most plumbing businesses are started by people that enjoy plumbing. And then they don't particularly enjoy running the business. Therefore, the, the business doesn't really grow. That's kind of the premise of the it's book. It's the, the sort of technician, the manager and the entrepreneur. Correct. You end Correct. up being There's, just the technician you, and just doing the work. You wear three hats, effectively. Yeah. So um, the I think one of the things that sticks with me from that book is that even if you aren't going to franchise your business, pretend you're going to franchise your business and write everything down mm. that you do, that you think makes you successful or as though you were going to charge someone for that information as with a franchise. And I think what we did do and right, right from the, the seller, I remember writing out like copious amounts of training notes on how to do recruitment and I think that if you can get a process which you can teach to other people and teach to people that no, have no prior recruitment experience, then you're on the road to scaling your business. I think it, it's very difficult to scale a recruitment business if you're only hiring people with experience. You've got to be able to train and develop um, trainees and people that have never done the job before and and to do that you need to break down what you're doing and what you can do successfully into an easy to follow process for for other people so you really so at that early period you really started sort of i guess 
cultivating the evolution way Do- documenting yeah mm. you know w- w- we were and when you when you say document just quickly just to be really clear are we talking about this is how you do business development when you get a job these are the questions you ask when you get a candidate this is what you do on the system like are we talking yeah. like yeah. that's yeah yeah so we, we we i remember yeah god you're taking me back now that but, but <laughs> A lot of the early training uh, I wrote, and it was around recruitment skills. It was around technical knowledge of your market, so understanding something about IT. And then there was the system skills. So there was a CRM system or database. And and I think you had to try and um, transfer skills in all three areas to people to help them to be successful. And I think at the beginning of someone's career, the clearer uh, guide you can give people of how to be successful in the job, the better they're going to be. Now, obviously, once you're six months in, once you're 12 months in, people can start to put their own stamp on it and to um, innovate and, and, and to try different things. But I think when you first start in a role and someone genuinely has never done a job before, you know, just asking them to get on and give it a go is, is, is just going to be a recipe for disaster, really. And again, I think that's, I think the, I think it's the process part. Again, you're doing things that um, before you technically maybe needed them because you could have said to those 10 people, get on the phone and I'll help you as you go. Right. But you were documenting it. So, so I love that. So sort of Gareth early on, on the business was right. I really need to document if we get two new people that don't have recruitment experience, we need to, they need to know exactly how to do things when they come through that, that door. Right. Okay. Cool. So I guess, so then um, just quickly then, what about during this period, obviously coming up to 2005, around the sort of first five year mark, obviously getting towards the sort of recession in 08, Mm -hmm. I guess, like what was IT recruitment back then? Because was LinkedIn, when, when was, when did LinkedIn happen? Because that's obviously a bit of a milestone. It's a good question. It's a really (laughs) good question. Um, I think that I think LinkedIn was starting to become popular before the the credit crunch and, and before the downturn in um, 2007 2008, uh, but probably really became big af- afterwards after that. Yeah. Um, and it was mainly job board orientated was before it? that, really. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 2002. Sorry, I just I just googled it. So 2002, yeah. they started. Okay. Yeah, but I, d- I don't think it was massive in in the in the UK. Because mm. what looking back then, would you like? Was, because obviously, would you say it was less crowded? Like it was it, w- it was quite quite easier. Um, like how, like could you as you said, it was more job board orientated. Like, yeah, th- did you have to be obviously not as niche as you probably have to be now? Yeah, I, ju- I just I just go 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 backwards for you. For, for you really um when when i was at computer futures the way you attracted candidates was was to advertise in the back of physical magazines <laughs> you, know, you used to have to write your adverts 10 days before it went to press by which That's time crazy. the jobs the jobs were filled um and you know computer <laughs> futures to their credit uh, dominated the advertising they bought an awful lot of advertising in computer weekly and computing magazines so we had a lot of candidates so you know, in terms of going to market to the client side, um, you had a lot of product, you know, you had a lot of people for them. So they, 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 they kind of, they kind of have to, had to work with you. Um, and then what happened was when the internet came along and you got job boards like JobServe and, and, and JobSite and, and, and those types of uh, companies, it democratized um, recruitment and it meant that you could start up a business from your cellar or from your bedroom and if you advertised on these job boards or you logged onto their CV databases you could actually get access to some of the people that the computer futures or the Hayes or whoever the the, the, the dominant players were at the time had access to so uh, mm. I think LinkedIn is just a natural continuation of that um, so the internet definitely allowed us to start our business up because, you know, advertising in trade press was thousands and thousands of pounds. Advertising on job boards was hundreds of pounds. Um, so it helped us 
but obviously it helped lots of other people as well so it meant you know if you've got an awful lot of competitors then the only way to combat that really is to specialize in in a particular area and be the best in the world at something um and i think you know that's really important for for any recruiter starting out is try to be a specialist in a particular market rather than try and be a jack of all trades um you know and accept that you're not going to work with every client and you're not going to be able to help every candidate but be absolutely brilliant in the area that you choose to focus and specialize in and your specialism was it it recruitment yeah yeah but but obviously within that we we have recruiters that specialize in in particular vertical markets and you know the the more specialist that you can go the better um but if if people were starting up businesses now you know it is way too general to, to to start a business in you'd have to take a particular niche and a particular area and say okay we're going to try and be the best in the world at, at this particular area um because i think there's just too much competition out there now to to be a generalist okay and just quickly just for context obviously i want to sort of talk a bit about what your business looked like going into the sort of financial crash and, and your experience there would um at that what was you predominantly perm business was it contract yeah pre- predominantly permanent um okay you know probably 90 percent of our net fees were probably through permanent and, t- and 10 percent okay. uh, on contract at the time so going into the financial crash then what did your business look like before that hit Ooh, i would say probably 30 35 people something like mm. that um and you know, it was a, it's obviously a long time ago now and pale, pales into sig- insignificance really compared to the, uh, the coronavirus. But I think we were pretty lean. So we didn't have um, a big uh, IT department. We didn't have a big marketing department. We didn't have anyone in HR. We had, you know, the owners of the business and recruiters and some team leaders. So um, from memory, we managed to ride out the storm okay and and by that i mean we didn't lose money so we were still profitable albeit that may have been a fairly small profit um and i think that's what we did we just cut our cloth accordingly and we didn't make anyone redundant we didn't you know ask anyone to leave the business but obviously we're in recruitment and if someone isn't making placements month after month after month sometimes people make their own decision don't they and say actually this isn't for me. So probably coming out of that uh, credit crunch and financial crisis, we were left with our best people, but just less people. And mm. and very much like a garden, I suppose if you prune your garden back, it it can grow uh, better and 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 and, and uh, you know um, be more productive yeah, on the on the other side. So obviously going through that, what what do you think the learnings through that period? what do you think applies to today? Obviously it's completely different, but like sort of looking back and just talking a bit about sort of that period and and that experience, I guess, out of that, what happened there, what what do you think sort of applies today from what you learned during that period? Um, Don't panic. You know, people don't want that that the leader to be uh, panicking or, or overly worried um i think make sensible logical decisions cut out any non-essential costs out of your business so um things that people wouldn't miss if you stop spending money on them um i think uh, support people uh, and make sure that people know that you know we've always been relatively conservative in the way we've run the business so we do have money in the bank um, and let people know that they need, they need reassurance. Um, but also if anyone hasn't worked through a recession or a downturn, there is life on the other side. This, this will not last forever. Although it feels like it in lockdown, <laughs> uh, it won't last forever. And I think, um, you know, tough times um, make tough people. And I think if, if you, your recruiters and your business can get through this period, you'll probably look back and say it was actually the best thing that ever happened to us because um, you have to be innovative, you have to change and you, you, you have to kind of seize the day. And what will happen is, you know, 
the, the strong will survive and you'll have a, a better, stronger foundation to build from, albeit there might be a few less people in your business because for some people, it, you know, it, it might become too much. Mm. Okay. First 10 years then of evolution's history then. Let's just sort of tie that together. So do, like, where was you sort of so got through that? I really like what you said there around the sort of garden analogy. Yeah. Came out the other side with even stronger people that you probably felt even more confident to build and grow a business with. Um, so where was you in 2010? Um, how many people, where, where was you revenue wise as well? Obviously, so I'm assuming you was around 30, 40 people. Or where was you revenue wise and as a business 10 years in? Do you know what? It's a really good question. Um, Roughly, so I'm not going to hold you to re- it. But... Revenue, 10 million maybe. Okay. So, so, something like that. Um, I think one of the things that we did do in the financial crisis is we invested in training. So we've made the decision that if the job's about to get a lot harder for people, we need to invest in training them and we got a full-time trainer into the business so you know that early uh, work that I'd put in creating training documentation and everything else um, this is part of scaling your business hire someone who's better than you at doing that particular part of the job so you know I was okay at it and um, you know I I definitely helped a a number of people early on in their career be, be successful but if you've got someone whose job it is full time and they're a training and development expert, they're going to do a better job than me. So we, we, we invested in, in training. And I think we got our first investors in people certification back in 2009. So wow. at a time where everyone else was probably cutting their training teams, budgets, departments, etc., we were just investing a little bit more in that because we knew, we knew that the job was going to be difficult for people and we needed to support them in, in so, that. So just quickly on, on that, cause I think this period has also highlighted that. And I think that's been quite a few of the conversations that I've had with recruitment business owners, yep. I guess just very quickly, if you were to summarize you investing then on learning and development and we're actually recognizing that it is going to be tough on the other side of this. Yeah. How did that decision on investing in your people and training enable your staff or how did it have an impact as they bounce back? I guess it'd be good to get your experience on that because that, there might be some similarities for people. I th- I th- I, I, and back yeah, I think, I think it's supporting the people that are doing the job on the front line while it's tough. So even just someone to do a coaching session, to listen, to understand, to empathize is, is good. Um, but what it allowed that person to do that we brought in in that training role was really to learn the business and learn more about recruitment. And then as we started to come out of that financial crisis, that person it understood recruitment more. So it allowed us to recruit trainees because the person understood the process, they understood what, what recruitment was and ha- how it all worked. And then, you know, we'd, we'd recruit uh, groups of trainees, put them through uh, tr- training school, give them support, give them training, give them de- development. And obviously, you know, a percentage of those would, would come out as successful and, 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 and decent recruiters on, on the other side. Mm. Okay. So for those first 10 years then, just quickly and then let's sort of move into the next decade yeah um knowing what we know now what what do you wish sort of you knew going into those first 10 years or the first couple of years do you think that you wish you like a lot (laughs) (laughs) um i think you know you've got bear in mind i was 25 when 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 we started the business so you know i was pretty young as a person yeah pretty inexperienced as a recruiter and had to learn a, a, an awful lot on the job so um what would I have done differently um perhaps invested more time quicker in somebody to work full-time in a training role to then allow us to recruit 
a, a bigger volume of trainees. April, yeah. yeah, exactly. Because I think if you really want to get your business moving, you've got to accept that you need to train people that have never done the job before and help them to be successful. And that is quite complicated. There's a lot to learn. You know, it's if people say things like, oh, recruitment is not rocket science. Well, I would argue that in this day and age with, with all the tools that you've got available and all the competition that, that, that's out there, it probably is rocket science. <laughs> so, you know, you, you, you don't underestimate what you find easy yourself as a recruiter is actually really challenging to train and develop other people in uh, and don't underestimate that challenge. And perhaps if we'd started that process a little bit earlier, then we'd have been a bit further on after, after 10 years. Mm. Do you think, I don't know, like, I know it's not because I'm thinking again, that's another sort of real big challenge as to what prevents growth for recruitment businesses um so i guess i don't know do you reckon that you could put a, put a bit of a trigger on when you should hire a internal trainer or is it just a, as soon as you could afford it consider having some sort of internal training resource yeah as, as soon as possible yeah e- either that or you know if you've started the business as a you know two or three of you it might be that one of you has a passion for doing that so it doesn't have to be a new hire or it might be somebody in your business who's a good recruiter um, that maybe gets more of a thrill by other people making placements than making placements themselves. So it's maybe giving them a, a an option, a, a career development opportunity, and moving them into a, a you know a training and development role. But I think if you are going to scale up your business, you have to train people to do the job. If you, yeah. if you want them to do it well and and do it successfully, that 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 would be my experience. <laughs> Okay, so going into the next decade then, because I'm sure, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming at that point you was like, wow, first 10 years in business, I mean, firstly, that's an amazing length of time, right? Yeah. So I'm sure there would have been some sort of like, right, then on the next decade, this is our vision and this is what we're thinking. I guess what, yeah. what was the mindset sort of of you and, and your business partners going into the, to the, the sort of 11th and, and the future of that I after think, those I think, 10 years? I, I think it was that, you know, the... the financial crisis where we we kind of realized our long-term goals for the business i don't think we're going to realize these just being a uk-based recruitment business really and yeah and i think there was very much there was a lot of talk at the time about um the the, the power uh, shifting from the west to the east mm. and that china was going to become the you know the, the the biggest economy and the most dominant player and i think we realized that we needed to expand out diversification outside, outside, yeah outside of, outside of the uk so i think from memory we had probably about 50 odd people on board um when we started opening uh, overseas offices first in germany and then in singapore and then in australia and i think what it does is provide what was the timeline on that sorry just quickly before i forget roughly I think Germany has been open for around 10 years now. Okay. Uh, Singapore, probably seven years. Australia, about five years. So that oh, okay. off, off, off so yeah, so that clear, so there was clearly a real motivation then to diversify the evolution brand into not just a UK business then off the back of the financial yeah. crisis. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think we just thought this is too risky to just, you know, um, purely be a, a UK uh, IT recruitment business. So that was kind of the, the thing that stimulated us and and um, nice story in terms of our German office so um, many many years ago we had uh, a guy that joined us as a placement student so he was if, if you do a degree in Europe you have to do a placement as part of your degree and if you speak any sort of English you tend to go and do it in an English speaking country because it's a good skill yeah. for them to have so he came over and work for us and you couldn't actually pay them wages it was kind of a strange system where you had to pay them i think expenses really uh, i think it was 600 quid a month you could you could pay people um and he came over and worked for us for i think it was nine months um but he spoke very very good english and in that time he, he made some placements and <laughs> he was actually uh, pretty good at the job so he finished his degree and then came back and joined us full time um, as an employee of the UK business. And um, he did a couple of years work in the UK market, um, but as a German. And then he, his then wife uh, got pregnant and wanted to move back to Germany. So he moved back to Germany around the time of, of the credit crunch. Uh, we kept in contact 
and then probably six to nine months later as we we're starting to come out of it we said you know you've always wanted to start your own business and we've always wanted to or you know expand evolution outside the uk how about starting something for us in germany so this guy that joined us as a placement student has now ended up so being cool. M- md of our german business so you know our, our purpose as a company is to help people and organizations realize their potential and he's a great example of someone that you know was a student that did a six month placement and then became an md and with a stake in his own business in in germany mm. so do, so let's just talk about the international expansion piece and that was going to be my first question around sort of what yeah. what the strategy was so you just shared a great story on how obviously basically what you what you had there was someone that soaked up the uk culture yeah. sort of understood what the evolution way was and then I, I feel like you'd be pretty confident that he'd be able to replicate that or understand what your purpose and mission is yep. as a business which meant that there's a good chance he could recreate that yep. in, in another country so i guess obviously we could combine obviously all the um sort of countries here that you've gone into but i guess what what was the the plan or what was the strategy on how you were going to sort of penetrate these markets these international markets has it always been you got someone from the uk office and they started to work obviously in these other international markets and then they went over there i guess what what yeah. was how did you approach it well germany was a, a little bit of a unique of situation really and i think it would be difficult for other other companies to replicate but what i would say with with regards to the other offices is you've got to find a great person to to set it yeah. up i think you know the success of that office is going to be probably 80 to 90 percent down to that person that person so yeah find someone that you trust find someone that shares your values and 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 find someone with local market knowledge experience so you know probably has been working in that market ideally five years you know they they, they they've got some relationships they've they've got some knowledge of which companies hire and which companies uh, are easy to recruit for and which are more challenging and then what we did was took that local person and then um, a business partner at the time would would then go out to those offices and spend you know up to a couple of years out there to make sure the evolution dna was 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 over in that Transfer. office as well yeah, yeah absolutely so I, I would say someone with local market knowledge is a must and somebody with your dna teamed up would be the best because i think that that's that's the challenge right because if i'm if i'm speaking to a recruit in singapore like obviously you said trust right obviously yeah. if they haven't worked for evolution before and it's a new hire you're backing them to do it do you get what i mean obviously that that yeah. it can be quite hard to get that right or you're worried about getting that right because obviously as you said 89 percent of the success of that would be down to that person um so i guess what what was what was the sell then because obviously they they'd have most of the leverage like if i'm a local person know the market and sort of i'm speaking to you as a uk recruitment business and saying look the what, what was the opportunity for me and sort of what did you make sure you saw in that person for you to go yeah this is the person we want to hang up head up our singapore or australian office i think that we um we, we made sure that there were share options available for those people in in those offices based on on hitting targets because obviously they're integral to that office and you want them to be tied into the long-term success so that's one way to you know to, to make sure that people are loyal and and and, and are there for the long term um, and how did you structure that just really simply just because i think sometimes it there can be just a lot of um smoke and mirrors with yeah you can get shares equity or whatever but how did you like if i'm thinking about opening an american office and i'm speaking to someone at the moment or whatever what was it like how did you structure it to favor them but also favor you yeah, just just document the agreement you know just make sure put, put, put it into a contract to say if, if you do x y and z you get this percentage of of that particular business okay. um and you know the thing with share options is they are executable upon an event you know upon mm. selling the business or floating the business so you only 
uh, get to benefit if you're there at the end and that's what you want exactly, you want yeah. that person tied in to be part of the journey not to do two years and then mm. and then disappear but if they hit milestones and they get some of the profit share which in the short term yeah, that's exactly. the motivation but long term it's that's, that's, that's your reward if you're running an office you need to put some sort of profit share scheme in place and that's only right and proper um but for the longer term it's okay you know if we, if we sell this business then you're, you're going to get a percentage of the value of that your office has created mm. so what are the common misconceptions recruitment business owners have on expanding international internationally do you think um you'd have to ask them <laughs> <laughs> what, what are the common misconceptions I, I don't know um i think like what was your biggest challenge probably penetrating a market when you're when you're on a standing start you know because mm. let's not kid ourselves most areas of the world have people doing recruitment already so you've got to go over there and offer something different or something better um and you know so, sometimes that takes time to to get known doesn't it if you mm. if you're just starting up a business it doesn't matter if you you've got some form of reputation in the uk or in germany no one knows you in Sydney or in Australia. So yeah. you've got to start, start that from scratch. Uh, that's the biggest challenge, isn't it? When mm. you turn up, you have no reputation. Um, and, and that's why I think the person who starts in the office probably needs to have that local market knowledge and you know be in a position where they've maybe got some relationships and, and some reputation themselves that they can bring to the party. Mm. And then... And then just just a quick one. Um, obviously, I know that you said obviously you had someone that went over there typically, but yeah. I guess what? How did you get better at instilling the evolution DNA? What was sort of the core? Because obviously, Singapore recruitment office culture is going to be different to your office yeah. in Warrington, right? And you've yeah. got to respect that and understand that. So I guess yeah. how have you gone about? Yeah, how have you gone about ensuring that that DNA and purposes transfers across all? different brands and do you make sure that I don't know that the UK team know that actually they do have offices in Australia and you try and sort of cultivate um these people to share knowledge and I don't know what how have you gone about sort of cultivating the sort of group it's it's, it, it's um I think it comes from the global board so um each of the offices has that the person that runs that office is on the global board so when we've done work um defining and you know honing down on our, our purpose and our brand promise and our values those people have been integral in that process so they then believe in what that those that purpose is what the brand promise is and what values are because they co-created it and then it's their job to go and instill that into their their offices um and i think you know if they have helped to create yeah get them involved in the that, process that, that vision then they're more likely to to go and um sort of make sure that their office actually lives 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 and breeds it um, How, I, no go on sorry I'd, I'd say a rough rule of thumb for us is everybody has the same purpose the same brand promise and the same values um and 80 percent of the culture of the offices is probably the same but then 20 percent has to be kind of unique to that that, to that country location. So, yeah a good good example would be in singapore team-based events are more round food than than they are around alcohol because <laughs> cult culturally that's what what matters to them um our german business um kind of changed the, the the dress code and dressed down a lot earlier than the other offices because that's what mattered to them but mm. it's they still shared the values of the business they still shared the brand promise and the purpose but what you do is some of the subtleties are different from from office to office mm. so what i was going to ask you was um like for you in your opinion scaling this recruitment business as you are expanding internationally like how how important were your company values and purpose when actually growing your business do you think how important are they because obviously you hear about hear about them all the time you see people put them on their website obviously you um, have so been to your office you have them over your walls and i guess like how how important are they when growing your recruitment business 
I think they're really important because I think it gives people an idea of the personality of the business and what's important to that business. And they make a, a choice. Do I want to be part of that or do I not? So you, you end up with um, a group of like minded people, albeit who, you know, you still want innovation, don't you? You still want people that are capable of doing things that are a little bit different or, or trying things or experimenting. But um, you know, our, our brand promise, for example, is to provide a great recruitment experience. So whether it's a, a candidate that we're placing, a contractor or a client, we want them to come away from that interaction uh, promoting our service. We want them to be advocates of our business. And if someone doesn't really share that, then they're probably not right to work in our business because um, if they just want to do a deal and, you know, they don't care if they leave a bad taste in people's mouths, then that isn't sustainable long term. And, you know, that, that's really important to us to make sure that people share that, that vision, really, of providing a great recruitment experience, whoever they're talking to. So, so obviously, the, the values part then also helps you say no to people or get more of the right people, basically, as, as yeah. you're hiring and growing. Yeah, um, we're okay. really, it's really, really simple when we when we um, were assessed for investors and in people back in 2009, the lady that did the assessment said, you know what, um, you, you, really impressive company. Um, people love working for the business. They speak passionately about it and they say the same sorts of things about your business. But you know what, you haven't actually got any values documented. So we, we went through a process then of talking to everyone in the business and saying, okay, well, what do you think is important? And, and getting workshops together and getting people to do some brainstorming. And we came up with, with seven values and, you know, a number so of that years, was co-created with co-created at the time in 2009. And all it was, was it was, it was documenting what we were anyway. They were always yeah. there. They just weren't, weren't explicit. And it was this lady that did our IIP um, sort of assessment that, that flagged it up to us, just said, it's crazy. You know, you, it's so clearly you've got values in your business, but you've just not kind of stopped to write them down. Um, and then a number of years later, it became clear that seven's just too many for people to remember. <laughs> and um, we, th there was also hygiene factors in there, you know, things like uh, professional. Well, the, 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 I suppose the, the key there is if someone isn't professional, they just shouldn't be working in your business. It's not something that you should be aspiring to be. Yeah. It should just be t taken as read. So we took the seven values and we did another workshopping session many years later with everybody in the different offices. And we said, what, which of these values is most important to you? And we boiled it down to three. And that was to be ambitious, innovative and collaborative. And, and I think when we hire ambition, I'm looking for someone who wants to achieve something in their life that has goals, meaningful goals that they're prepared to work hard to, towards. If somebody doesn't have ambition, the best thing you can do is not offer them a job yeah. because you're just going to do them a disservice. Because in recruitment in this era, unless you're ambitious, it's going to be really, really difficult for you. Mm -hmm. Innovative. The world's changing, recruitment's changing at a faster pace than it's ever changed before. So you've got to be capable of taking on board new ideas and running with them and also coming up with a few yourself. You can't just always rely on someone else to, to tell you what to do and to explain, um, you know, how to do recruitment. Sometimes you need to join some of the dots yourself. And finally, um, and, and probably most importantly, being collaborative. So we achieve more by working together. And I think, you know, in recruitment, you do get people who are individual contributors and that's okay, but you can't be toxic to the, to your colleagues the around rest. you. Yeah. Your success can't mean that someone else isn't successful as a result. And, and I think that's really, really important that I'd much rather, you know, a B plus team player than the, the, than an A star uh, individual contributor that, that, that ruins everything around them. Mm. So, um, keen to sort of just talk a bit about how you um, scaled your business, obviously going into the next 10 years after that first decade. But I guess obviously the, the, the real motivation going into after those 10 years was the diversification, international expansion. Yep. So after obviously you achieved that, I guess overall now, even you can talk about from, from where you are now, I guess, like how much of an impact did that then have on the profitability of your 
recruitment business then? Because obviously that's something that you learned during the financial crisis and thinking, yeah. well, actually, we'll probably have more longevity as a business. Like, did it then actually, has it made your business more profitable? Yeah, I mean, I would say opening international offices in the short term is an investment. So um, in my experience, don't expect to make huge amounts of profit within the first two or three years. But what you're doing is trying to invest for five years time. So it takes time. You know, you've got to get office space. You've got to hire someone to start the office. You've got to hire employees who aren't necessarily going to be productive straight away. Um, but you've got to stick with it. So you've got to you've got to invest for, for the long term. So I'd say opening any overseas office in the short term, you're likely to make less profit in the short term. But long term, you've given yourself another growing point. You've given yourself uh, another way to grow your business, grow your net fees and, and, and grow your profit. So, yeah, mm. long, longer term, it will help you to become more profitable. Short term, you've got to accept you're going to have to spend money to, to spend make money. money. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's definitely long term. It's increased the equity value of evolution and, and your business. Yeah, because an, is, inter, an international recruitment business is, is generally going to be worth more than yeah. you know one that just operates in one particular country. And then I guess to bring it, I, guess, oh, I was, I was going to say also then to bring it today, mm. but and then globally we've been affected by this. I was going to say how useful is it being to be sort of diversified in terms of different, con, being in different continents because uh, maybe it has, maybe it hasn't, but I think obviously financial crisis, it wasn't a global, it wasn't a global event, was it? But I guess ha, has it helped being diversified in the current challenges, would you say? Um Maybe more so in Australia, maybe. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think you know, they, the, the coronavirus hasn't really uh, wreaked much havoc in Australia. Um, that said, they were very proactive as a country about going into to lockdown. So they still had lots of the same challenges. Um, but I'd say their economy is moving a bit quicker now than, than for example, the economy in, in, in the UK. Um, Singapore you know, after China was hit quite early and then seemed to get hold of things. And then suddenly a month or two later went into lockdown because a lot of the migrant workers in Singapore ended up with the coronavirus. Mm. Um, Germany, again, they've managed to control the coronavirus very successfully. Um, but one of the challenges we've got in Germany is that um, employment rights for permanent employees are very strong they're very employee centric and even if people are on their version of the furlough scheme in germany they're only paid 60 or 67 percent of their salary based on whether they've got a family or not but oh, German, wow. Ger germans are still keen to stay with their existing employer rather than take the risk of moving so jobs moving, yeah yeah because the way employment w law works in germany is that you have very few employment rights in the first six months uh, and then you are very much protected thereafter so yeah, yeah, yeah. um you know our permanent it candidates are still nervous about moving jobs even if they are not actually actively working for their businesses because they're still getting some income and they're kind of um yeah um risk averse if you like about mm. putting themselves into that position when they're in a probationary period with a new business Okay, interesting. Um, so I guess thinking of sort of, I mean, a lot of people will sort of have the mindset that they want to grow their recruitment business. Mm. Obviously, 100, circa 160 people, it's, it's a lot of people, right? Obviously, you've got different offices. I guess just just thinking about that for a sec, what do you think? Obviously, you invested a lot into training, um, clearly from the very beginning, documented your process. But I guess what would you say were some of the key factors that, enabled you to scale your recruitment business to the the amount of people you have was it the the strategy of getting a bulk of people through your academy and, and yeah. growing it that way or what would you say were some of the key sort of aspects to enable you to scale would you say yeah i think if you if you think about it in a logical um order you've got to have good people doing internal recruitment because arguably it's the most important job in your business if you hire really good people with great potential then a decent percentage of them will work out to be successful recruiters yeah. so get your ir right in the first instance and then once you've got the right people when, sorry when did you did you when did you did, when did you start building that team out of interest 
over 10 years ago you okay, know cool. um yeah th- i think we just found that the rec to rec companies we work with um were just very sporadic really in 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 the people that they could or would send us mm-hmm. um so we had no choice <laughs> we, we had to build an internal team yeah. um because there was no way we could we could grow via um rec to rec candidates um and the people that have worked internal in internal recruitment have done a great job they've recruited people with the right kind of raw attributes raw skills and then obviously we've slotted them into this um training program and training process to give them the best chance of being successful no one can guarantee anything but what you're trying to do is give people the best possible chance Mm. so investing in obviously your internal recruitment function yeah and then going down the training program academy route so that what did that mean that you was able to i don't know hire 10 15 eight people at once rather than yeah that that was that was um it's become more difficult over the last few years because uh, the country's been virtually at full employment in the uk so getting a quantity of people to start on one day has been very very (laughs) difficult but yeah historically we would we would recruit a you know a group of people and i think that works really well in many many ways a it gives people uh, peers to compete against when they first start in the job yeah. so you can make it a bit of fun um secondly they've got friends in the business straight away you know if you think about it walking into a company where there's maybe 100 people in an office and you're the newbie that's a little bit um overwhelming for some people whereas if you're starting on the same day as three or four other people you've immediately got friends to go, you know, go for lunch with, chat with, talk through the training with, um, you know, support you in terms of when, when, when you're on the phones, making calls and, and trying to make your way in recruitment. If you, you, the, your only point of reference is your manager who's been doing it for 10 years, that's, that's quite difficult, isn't it? But if mm. you are in it with other people like you, um, I think that helps, gives people peer, peer support. So, so we've so we've spoken a lot about getting new people into the business. What 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 have been the key things you've done to retain the the best people in your your business? I mean, I, I've met a couple of people in your business, and I think online a lot of people you're not better than me, but it seems like a lot of people have worked at Evolution for quite a long period. So I guess what have been some of the key things that have contributed to you keeping hold of some of your best people? Would you say? Um, I think um, there's a few things really. Um, one is the way you treat people. So I think as a person, um, I genuinely care about our purpose of helping people realise their potential. So people who go on and achieve success in our business, I, I'm really, really proud that, that they've done that, not for me, but for them. And I think people know that that's sincere. I don't think you can make that up on a day-to-day basis. When you see these people every day, you play football with them, you, you, you know, you, you, you go on social events with them and things like that. People see through if that's not how you really are. So um, be sincere, be fair, um, put their best interests at heart, not your best interests. Uh, leaders should eat last, not not first. And I think people know that I think there's trust there hopefully that people know in the DNA of the business we do care about them we do want them to be successful and you know what people do leave that's recruitment nobody will stay with you forever and even people that have gone on perhaps they've gone overseas moved out of the industry I'm still pleased when I see other people doing well you know if if if, if you know I've had people reach out to us that I haven't worked for us for five years and say, do you know what? You gave me a great start in recruitment. I enjoyed my three or four years with your business. Um, you know, you're still the best company we've worked for or whatever. It's really nice when people remember that and come back years later to, to, to say that. And I think, you know, you've always got an advocate and a, and a friend for the future. So yeah, treat, treat people how you'd want to be treated, be fair, try and see things from the other person's perspective it's always really easy to see things from your own perspective in life but try and sit sit on the other side of the fence um and you know give people opportunity as well you know i think there's there's definitely with falco being the example in germany people who've started 
uh, different brands for us, started divisions, grown teams, moved patches. You know, if you can give people a fresh challenge every so often in a career, that helps as well because mm. you can't just do the same thing day in, day out for, for 10 years. And have you, have you had to cultivate that mindset? Because I, I, I do believe that's true. I mean, I haven't been to your office. It's a big office and I can see you there sat there on the floor and you seem you see them someone that's really approachable and i think if you think 160 person business and i can see the ceo sitting over there he's not in that you're not in a corner office and mm-hmm. i don't have to go through a couple of doors to find you and do you get what i mean so i guess yeah. have you been on a journey with that yourself or has that just been sort of innately think, how you how you've been i think probably a couple of things i think it is in 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 my personality you know i i i I don't think you can fake caring about other people. You either yeah. do or you, or, or you don't. Um, and I think that I realized very early on that, that the success of the business relied on other people. So you better be nice to them <laughs> because they're, you know, they're, 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 they're more important to the success of the business than I am. I'm, a, I'm only one person. Did you there's find a, that a... hard to let go of that? Because I think that's the check. Like your ego can get in the way of that. And like you started this business in your cellar and you're going, I'm, the other people more important i don't don't don't, don't really have an ego at all <laughs> um, you know I, I think it's it's genuine where there's a lot of people in our business that are better than lo- lots of aspects of our business than i am um i suppose what i've done well is is find those people and encourage them to join our business and then empower them to get on with their job and then support them and 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 you know what support them when things aren't going well because everybody's a hero when, when things are going well. But yeah. when someone's made a mistake, just empathize and sympathize and say, do you know what? In the same position, I think I'd have probably made the same mistake myself. So mm. don't beat yourself up about it. And, you know, as long as you learn from it, just try not to make the same mistake again. Um, and I think, you know, I did read a book, um, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Yeah, that's a great and book. It's, it's a brilliant book, a book in terms of how to treat other people and yeah. that probably it goes such a long way yeah but it, 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 it probably crystallized what i already felt was the right thing right. to do yeah but 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 gave me confidence that that actually yeah this this is the way i want to be mm. this is this is how i want to be remembered and you know i want people at work for the business to think uh great business and a great person not not because i'm some you know heroic leader just because they feel as though i had their back and i supported them and helped them especially when it's when it when times are difficult no, no i absolutely love that guy i think that's and then they're the types of things that you don't typically associate with recruitment or a recruiter or so i, I just love that i think that's great i think doing the right thing really goes a long way and like it sounds basic and simple but mm. you can build a great profitable big business by having that type of mindset and, and i think that's that's awesome mm. so uh, before we um finish i know obviously to pa- unpack 20 years of um your business but i guess just before we finish what i'd love to just get your thoughts on gareth is i think when you when you've been in business for that long um, I feel like that you could be susceptible to being comfortable or getting complacent and sort of you, you could very easily have the mindset of, well, we did it this way five years ago. So that's how we're doing it. Do you get what I mean? So I guess what, what sort of been your journey with ensuring that evolution recruitment, although you're 20 years old and you built a sustainable business, which is amazing, but what have you done to make sure that you don't get left behind? And as you said, recruitment is changing as fast as it ever has and you always hear sort of old school recruiters or old school recruitment now so i guess what have you done in your business to make sure that you're not you're not putting that box of uh over at evolution they're they're old school they've been around 20 years what 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 because that could be quite difficult right so i guess how how have you found that journey and what have you done always invested in technology so we've always had a bespoke crm system we've got an in-house it team we are ourselves microsoft gold partners as a, as a business um for the quality of the it team so we've over the last probably 12 to 18 months redeveloped our crm system from scratch uh, in you know latest technologies cutting edge technologies which allows 
integration with the things like LinkedIn and, and, and mm. the tools that people are just using as a standard. Um, I think that having or defining being innovative as one of our values is really important. And I think often the innovation comes from the floor. So having said earlier that when people start in the industry, it's about teaching them process. And I believe that it, that it absolutely is. What you've then got to do probably six to 12 months in is give people the confidence to try things and mm. the, the, to, to innovate and, and, and to take chances and take risks. And if it succeeds to then go and tell the rest of the business about it. So one of the uh, most sort of best things we do really is run masterclasses with recruiters who are doing the job, who are trying things and when they achieve success consistently, then in their own words, tell the rest of the business Love that. what they've done and how they've done it well. So the innovation comes from listening and talking to people who are on the front line, who are doing the job and talking to, 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 to your best billers and talking to, you know, even your okay billers and saying, what's working, what's not? When you say that's working, do you think you could write a masterclass about that? Do you think you could document that in some form of process that other people could understand? And then they get experience of presenting in front of their colleagues. And you know what I found over the years is that people often want to hear about new ideas from people who are doing the job like them rather than someone like me who <laughs> you know it, it sort of lasted recruitment 15 years ago or whatever um, and again that's that's just hey don't, don't don't take it personally people want to hear from people who are actually doing the job and are your top billers now not what happened yeah that's amazing day of so back, again it's your humility right and so that's, that's really cool so it's come from actually sort of you you making sure that people are living and breathing your values and you're cultivating those things that you just said through your people which makes it more current and can drive influence internally not from you but actually from the people that are on the front line yeah yeah absolutely let, love that let, let, let them tell the story because they'll do it far better uh, far in a far more convincing way and people can identify with people like themselves who are doing the job now in, in, mm. in this era and you know what there's so much good stuff that is going on in our recruitment business and all the recruitment businesses out there but just take the time to listen to the people and what they're doing and then encourage them to mm. to, to document it you know back to that process thing oh you're doing this really good thing right you can't just have a quick chat with someone else about it you just need to write it down um, yeah. and and you know i remember hearing a phrase you haven't got a strategy until it's written down well if someone's doing something great but they can't really document it it's not going to help you change your business yeah. and move it forward you get 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 it in a presentation share it with people and then hopefully other people can learn too that's amazing um so before, so I guess just quickly before I just ask you a couple of last questions. So what, what does, what does a CEO of your business do now then? So talking a lot about other people, like what, cause I, cause like, yeah, what have you, what have you ended up really focusing your time on and resource on like as a CEO of a sort of hundred person recruitment business, what, what do you end, what does a typical day look like for you then? Yeah. Uh, busy. <laughs> uh, I think, um, I'm someone who is quite hands-on by, by nature. Yeah. So um, a number of the, um, the, the the different departments still report into me. Okay. Um, I've got two very good managing directors in the UK business who run the sales teams um, and then got very good people running our overseas teams. But, you know, in terms of our, our, our development and data team, our internal recruitment team, HR team, there's still a number of functions that do re that report into me. Um, so I make sure, I suppose, on a day to day basis that what we're setting as our strategy as a business is what we're actually get doing on a on a daily basis because you can have the best strategy in the world if it's not implemented correctly yeah. it's it's still going to fail um and it's you know constantly reminding people of our purpose um which is to to help people and organizations to realize their potential so if you're a manager in our business your job is to help your team realize their potential yeah. if you're a recruiter your job's to help your candidates and clients to realize their potential um make sure that um our, our brand promise is upheld we you know we, we do a lot of um net promoter score 
uh, surveys. So, you know, we've got a net promoter score of plus 83 at the moment, which is higher than Apple, Amazon, and Netflix. And Love that man. means that the majority of people that interact with our business uh, promote you know promoters of our business um and it's also making sure that you know people are, are living our values and 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 you know, praising and rewarding people that are, are doing the right things you know mm. um be it ambition on the sales side and people you know producing great figures or people who are running master classes and being collaborative or people that are coming up with new ideas that they can then roll out to the to, to the rest of the business so i suppose it's you know helping and supporting all the other people that are quite frankly more important than me in the business do their job effectively while making sure that there's cohesion and coherence between you know what we're trying to achieve I'm involved, and yeah. the strategy of the business so um final sort of question then and, and then i'll ask you the last question um we see i'd be stupid to not ask sort of what your opinion and perspective is on sort of just putting COVID-19 aside a second, just sort of the future of the recruitment industry. Obviously you've, mm. you've been in recruitment for a real while and mm. obviously back to your point of recruitment is rapidly changing faster than it ever has before, I guess, where, where does your sort of mind and thoughts go when you think the future of the, our industry, would you say, what, what comes up for you when you think about the future of recruitment? Um, I think specialists, rather than generalist and I think if you're an individual recruiter or you're running a recruiting business you've got to to think about what can you be the best in the world at and and I think the people that I've seen be most successful as recruiters have a genuine interest and passion about the sector that they're recruiting in. Mm. So they're attending meetups, they're reading articles, they're watching YouTube videos, and they're trying to add value, genuinely trying to add value to, to, to their candidates and clients. So I think unless you're doing that, I think it's going to be very challenging uh, go, going forward. Um, but that said, I still passionately believe that recruitment done well is a is, is a brilliant job in in a brilliant industry so you know how many industries are there where you can help somebody realize their potential in their career by finding them the, the next job in you know in, in in their career ladder um helping companies to grow because ultimately a business is only as good as the people that work there and if you're providing a business with great people you, you're helping to grow that business you, you're making a real difference and and also you know from a recruiter's perspective you've got an opportunity to um progress your career really really rapidly you know you've you've mm. got an opportunity to achieve uh, the same number of promotions you would in any other industry probably you know it take you 10 years in in, in, in a typical industry, it might take you two or three in recruitment. And obviously, if you're successful, then it can be rewarding as well financially. But I think that's the byproduct of doing a great job. I think if, if it's only about making money, then sooner or later, you will get found out. I think you've got to have a sincere um, you know, passion for helping the, the candidates and the, and the clients to be successful. And then business starts to come to you. You know, people refer you and recommend you, promote your service, and the job starts to become easier. And again, it sounds basic, but you'd be surprised how many people don't have that intention mm. and don't do the right thing by their clients and candidates. And yeah, it will go a long way. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess j just, just quickly then, um, sort of if I'm a sort of aspiring recruitment entrepreneur or I'm a recruitment business owner right now that's looking at sort of you and your business and thinking wow I'd love to sort of get to the point where they are or whatever I guess what what would you say if I have a recruitment business right now and I, I want to scale my business um to sort of the heights of of you guys what what should I be thinking about what would you be saying to me if I wanted to be sort of where you are in the next five to ten or so years I think it's important to learn from the past, but not actually try and replicate it because the world's changing. So what Love worked that. in the past isn't necessarily going to work in the future. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd say, you know, inch wide and mile deep. So try and pick something that um, has good long term prospects as a market um, and try and dominate a niche rather than go general and just you know sort of not even touch 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 the sides so try and be really famous for doing something rather than try and doing everything for for, for everybody because i think that's 
going to be really really difficult going going forward um and in terms of you know anybody that's sort of join, joining the industry as a recruiter is the one thing you can control is how hard you work so people have more sales experience more sales skills more empathy more persuasion skills than others you can work on that but what everybody can decide is how hard they work on a day-to-day -day basis and you know if you want to be successful in this industry i think you've got to be take a genuine interest in the market that you do you've got to be want to be seen as an expert and to, to be able to add value but you're going to need to work hard so if, if, if you read any book of any successful business person uh, any successful politician or sports person you can see virtually on every page how hard they've had to work like to, get, to, to get to where they are and um you know uh, this is my, my my rant i've got you know children i've got um three girls um youngest is nine eldest is uh, 16 and my worry is that social media gives people the edited highlights of everyone else's life that yeah. looks brilliant um sometimes isn't actually true and the bit that is not promoted is how hard someone's had to work to get the outcome that they're then busy showing everybody on on social media and i really do worry for a generation of people that they don't understand the inputs that you have to put in to get the nice shiny things at the end yeah as uh, uh, you know as, as as the output um yeah. and i i just hope that that doesn't uh, give a whole generation of people unrealistic expectations to say oh. well actually yeah, what's required what's required to be successful because mm. ju just read books of, of people who are successful and th th they're not working three or four hours a day mm. it's, <laughs> it's what it's one of the most common dumb, uh, the not, um the, one of the common things that everyone says when I say what are the sort of top traits in top billers that you've seen yeah. work ethic is, is always up there. And yeah. no, you're completely right. It's why I'm completely obsessed with sport documentaries that because normally football, basketball, cricket is the, the latest one that I'm watching on Amazon prime called the test, which is unbelievable. I don't even like cricket, but I just love it for the reason that you're talking about because in the high level sports, you see the finished article, you see the person on the tennis court, you see the person on the football pitch. But we've now in the world where you actually documentaries like this and stuff like that, they can, you can peek behind the curtain and see the hard work that Michael Jordan put in and the amount of free shot, free throws that he threw before he got onto that court. And I think, um, I don't know, that's why they resonate with me so much because it's just the work ethic and everything else. It, it's just so good to promote that and showcase that. You're completely yeah, right. People need to understand what's required. And it's okay to think, actually, I'm not sure that I want to work in recruitment because yeah. I'm not sure I want to put that level of effort in. But I think if you intend on being successful in your life, you need to understand what's required and i think and what you're signing up for it, yeah it, you know the edited highlights of someone's life on social media it looks brilliant doesn't it it looks absolutely brilliant but what they're not telling you is all the hard work that's yeah. taken them to, to to get to that point and and i think it's up to people like us to tell people the truth because you know that's been i suppose my mantra you know as a as a as a as business owner as a manager is you've got to be honest with people yeah. you, know, <laughs> you can't say to people in the interview process oh don't worry you know you can, you can turn up and turn up when you want and make a couple of calls and you know this time next year you'll be earning hundred thousand pounds it's just not true yeah, you've got yeah. to work really really hard build the market take a sincere interest in what you're doing uh, care be passionate and do you know what if you do all those things for a sustained period of time you will have a really really good career and and, and you'll make a really really good living mm. but that's the byproduct it's mm. not just something that gets kind of gifted to you no i love that look final question um what i was asked what what are you excited about gareth what what is the future of evolution that like obviously post covid what what are you uh, what are you excited about that you want to shout about Ooh, great 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 question um do you know what i think the resilience that the business has shown to date 
with the coronavirus has been exceptional. I think the ability of everybody to work from home effectively um, and to still produce results has been has, has been you know amazing really to see. Um, we set out this year to roll out our new CRM system around uh, each of the offices. And I've got to be honest, when, when the coronavirus hit, I thought, okay, that's going to be really difficult in our overseas offices. So um, in Q2, we're rolling out to Australia. Obviously, the flights got cancelled. Our developers <laughs> couldn't get over there. And what they've done is, by great collaboration, by a lot of early mornings from the UK team and late nights from the Australian team, we're actually ahead of schedule and by the end of this quarter we will roll out the new crm system to australia Amazing. and they've said it's made a huge difference to them um the experience is better it's quicker it handles latency better it's helping them do the job more effectively uh it's using kind of cut, cutting edge technologies and i suppose if we can get to the end of this year and despite the fact that probably no one from the UK will have been able to travel to an overseas office, we've still managed to roll out that new CRM system successfully to the, to, to the other offices. That will be very exciting because that was a long-term plan, which could have easily been disrupted. But at the moment due to people finding a way and, and being innovative, um, the, the, the rollout's actually gone better in Australia than we could have possibly hoped for. Love that. Look, Gareth, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for your time.